Well, thanks everybody for coming um, to our metadata scientist series and presented to you by IDISC, the Institute for Data Science and Computing, and this one, especially with dialogues and research ethics. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Alberto Cairo to introduce our speaker today. So, Alberto. Hi, Michael. Happy New Year, everyone. I think that this is our first Meet the Data Science of 2021, 20, right? Correct? So, well, Happy New Year, everyone. It's good to, good to see you all. Thank you for, for being here. As you know, this series is a, um, an ongoing series of lectures that consists of um, presenting you, I would say, the human face of data science, trying to explain not only what data scientists do, and also the huge variety on, on, and diversity of, of work that is being done in data science, but also presenting you the human face of data, the data science, the people behind everything that is being done in, at IDISC and many other institutes that deal with these, uh, with these matters. So it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce uh, Ken Goodman, friend and colleague at IDISC, He's the director of ethics, the uh, ethics and, uh, and society program at IDISC and also co-director of, uh, of UM's uh, ethics programs. Uh, he's also the founder and director of the Miller School of Medicine Institute for Bioethics and Health Policy, uh, which has been designated by the World Health Organization as collaborating center in ethics and global health policy just one of, one of only 10 in the, in the world. I'm not going to read his entire bio because you can, you can read it in the, the, um, uh, the, the, the lecture series uh, a website. I would just say that Ken has long experience uh, thinking about the ethical implications of technology and, and data, which personally is an area that greatly interests me. He has a author or co-author several books, a few of them I can strongly recommend because I have read them. And he's also, he also hosts his own series of lectures, dialogues, dialogues, sorry, dialogues in research ethics. And the lecture today is actually a, in partnership with these a lecture, lecture series. So Ken, thank you for, for being with us um, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it a lot. Um, What's exciting, when we get things right, which I think is probably more frequently than we think, we do stuff like this. I'm trying to look at the, the people on this on, and have uh, logged into this. How often does the University of Miami, any university, have people from all three campuses actually participating in something like this? One of the missions of IDISC, and for that matter, the Institute, with all the ethics programs at UM, is to do precisely that. And so you will forgive me I don't know if that's a request or an entreaty, but I'm going to ask you all to forgive me if I seem to be too excited about the opportunity of, of serious inter-institutional, inter-departmental, inter-denominational uh, collaboration on these issues. Uh, something right is happening here. And, and, and part of what I want to signal is while we're busy talking about how, how, how uh, look, when someone needed to rise to the occasion for, for climate, our colleagues at Rasmus rose to the occasion. I heard y'all are having on your planet a big public health problem. Uh, and there are people who've been testing vaccines at our institution. In some sense, what we, what we can increasingly say with plausibility is we've got that. In other words, what's happening at our institution when it goes right is exciting and wholesome and good. And IDISC is a, sort of a universal donor the way ethics is uh, to all inquiry. Uh, is in a position to actually shape the way the University of Miami contributes to the growth of knowledge in the world. Now, that sounds great, uh, and, and uh, that's a promissory note that you'll see whether or not I can cash over the next hour or so. Uh, I actually won't take me that long. I, I intend, uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that I, I, I care about you all, is not to talk too much. Uh, but I do have a few thoughts that I want to share. And uh, not to mention, not to mention these these damn things called uh, slides. So once again, this is this is a collaboration between uh, IDISC and the Institute for Bioethics, and for that matter, the University Wide Ethics Programs. Uh, we don't do just bioethics; we collaborate with our colleagues everywhere. Uh, for those of you who like to save these things, this is an abstract uh, that comes from the flyer that we sent around, and it underscores that this is a collaboration with IDISC. This is me, a data scientist series. So some of you might plausibly say, what on earth is he doing here? Um, and so I thought that, I, I, well, well, we all have histories that go back a ways. 
um, maybe it would be well to say a little bit about why I'm interested in this. I was actually, uh, many years ago, uh, sometime about the time the earth cooled was in Pittsburgh, uh, working in a lab at Carnegie Mellon, and we were doing a project on, on artificial intelligence and natural language processing. And, but down the street was University of Pittsburgh Medical School, where I was trying to teach ethics to med students. What we did was totally unrelated until I, by the way, the way how you, the, the, if, if you have a stomach ache, this is in Japanese, uh, this was to do automatic translation in a doctor patient domain, where a patient would walk into the doctor's office in Japanese and say, atama ga itai, and, and the computer would translate it to the English speaking physician as I have a stomach ache. Um, the, the other thing I learned how to say was, um, I, I want to register for the conference. So there was the conference registration domain. Okay. We find ourselves in the context of data science, correcting previous mistakes. In fact, the history of science is about correcting previous mistakes. I'm delighted to see a number of philosophers here. So anything I say is going to be required for you to keep me honest. But my favorite quote in epistemology is this one from Will Rogers. Uh, it isn't what we know that gives us trouble, it's what we know that ain't so, um, which, which suggests that we, want, we, we harbor a number of false beliefs, always have, and, and might for some time continue to do so. Data science is an effort, among other things, to reduce that ignorance, to reduce that uncertainty. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Otavio, you got to forgive me, but I wanted to share something that I learned interesting in, 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 uh, from, from a colleague. This, for anybody who remembers this, is very simple. It's the law of the excluded middle. Basically, you say it is a P or not P, or if you like, it's not the case that P and not P. Uh, you know, there's something can't be true and false at the same time. Uh, you can't, you can't, it, it can't both be raining and not raining at the same time. Now, that works well enough for most things in science. Either germs cause disease or they don't. Either bodily humors cause disease or they don't. Either there's a genetic component to disease or there's not, that sort of thing, right? Now, obviously there are challenges when it comes to, to quantum logic and fuzzy logic, but for the most part, this works well enough to capture most ordinary intuitions. What I learned that was interesting though was this. Nick, if you're here, we need a bigger budget for special effects and graphics. <laughs> What I learned was the following. I learned this from um, uh, Otavi, you may remember or heard of anyway, Ed Shu. Um, so this is a dog, this is a path, and this is a rabbit. This is a if it were a hound dog, I just like this dog, so I don't have a hound dog, uh, but this, this dog ain't never caught a rabbit. Um, he's chasing <laughs> the rabbit down the path. He loses track of it, and then gets to a fork in the road. Rabbit went either left or it went right. Apparently people who know dogs well enough will, will tell you the following. The dog will get to the juncture and then randomly sniff one way or the other. And if he sniffs left, for example, and he gets the scent of the rabbit, he'll head off that way or right that way. But if he sniffs left and does not get a scent, he will then immediately run off to the right without sniffing. Does the dog know the law of the excluded middle? In other words, it's got to be one or the other, can't be both. Uh, and, and he manages without doing an additional confirmation or test to actually find the rabbit, in, at least in principle. Okay. When it comes to data science, we have a number of traditional methods for, for, for well, for all science for that matter. Um, uh, and, and, and for those of us who have an interest in this, this is the history of, of science, of all the sciences, of physics, of cosmology, of biology and medicine. We, we try and understand the world, generally speaking, more or less, by framing hypotheses and then by testing them. We do observations, we do experiments, and we do tests, at least more or less. I mean, the, 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 the debates in, in, in scientific, uh, about scientific method in the philosophy community are, are large and long-standing. What's happening with data science though is, is something that's changing. And I think that's what I wanna spend most time talking to you about because I think it raises really interesting and important ethical issues. Okay, so a little bit of history of data science. Um, the great, the great Al-Kindi, uh, this is, this is uh, 801 to 873. Those are not page numbers, that's the year. 
so he, he's he's uh, he's uh, in in Arabia. He is a, a he's a cryptologist. He's a logician. He's a philosopher. And he says, you know, if you have a simple enough text, a plain text, he called just a bunch of text, and you start looking at the uh, that has characters in it, you can actually calculate the ones that have the greatest frequency. And once you do that, you can start filling in the blanks in any other text based on frequency of characters in your language. It may work better or worse for different languages, but this is sort of the origins of cryptography. You can actually make inferences about the world simply by looking at the recurrence of something, in this case, in, in just a long text or so, okay? Uh, for those of you who've already thought ahead, what is it, in, in some sense, a plain text is, is a, a training uh, data set for an algorithm, right? Well, it depends on what text you use, but you might get different answers where you might have greater or lesser success with your actual uh, translation or de-encryption of, of the other text, depending on the, on the text you choose at the beginning. Okay. Fast forward to the great, to the great Thomas Beddoes, um, English physician, um, and uh, he, he invented the pneumatic system. He wanted people, he thought you could cure people by having them inhale various gases, experimented uh, with nitrous oxide, uh, got himself in political trouble. He was accused of being a, a friend of the French Revolution. Read the quote. He's talking about biomedical data, but it could apply to any number of different kinds of sciences. Uh, and in some sense, it's what we do now in, in a lot of the sciences. All of the things that happen, all the interactions between clinicians and their patients generate, well, he calls them, he calls them um, uh, facts. <laughs> Remember facts. Well, anyway. Um, he points out that we just do a terrible job. This is obviously in the 18th and early 19th century, a terrible job of collecting that. We don't observe things very well. And when we observe them, we don't do a good record keeping. He counts that as, as, as important observational data that is on an ongoing basis being lost. Okay. Um, uh, you can see right here, the origins of Archie Cochran and evidence-based practice. Uh, there are how many articles are published in the literature each year and how familiar are you with all of them, right? Uh, we can't, it used to be you couldn't keep up with the data, now you can't keep up with the literature. But in any case, you see the problem. We, 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 have, we are muddled through methodological challenges. We're generating a lot of data and we're losing it. Uh, let's skip forward, uh, actually forward and back at the same time, uh, actually mostly back, but, but the consequences of, of follow Meadows. So, so Pierre Louis, French, a French physician, um, started looking at uh, outcomes from, um, from bloodletting. Everybody remembers the origin of bloodletting, right? This is based on the humoral theory of medicine. Uh, there are four bodily humors. There's, there's black bile, green bile, phlegm, and blood. And when they are in balance, you have too much of one, too little of the other, that's what causes illness. He actually looked at a bunch of bloodletting examples and found out that people for whom, who were bled, by surgeons, uh, uh, I don't know if any historians here, uh, but as, as you know, in, 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 um, in the old days, um, surgeons, for example, were also barbers because they had sharp objects. Uh, and so during the humoral theory of medicine, if you had too much blood, they would bleed you. Uh, and that was actually the standard from the middle ages up through actually through the, through the early 19th century. Certainly in the late uh, 18th century, uh, it, George Washington um, was famously overbled by his physicians. George Washington was killed by his physicians who bled him too much. Um, I, I, uh, uh, they, the, the, uh, Louis' work had not yet made it to the, uh, to the new world. But look what he's saying. Well, all we have to do is count. It's methodologically trivial, but it made a big deal at the time when you applied it to a bunch of data we're collecting about, well, cutting people open and taking their blood out. Uh, for those of you interested, we're, we're going to talk about confirmation and, and, and reproducibility in a second. But imagine all the confounders. So, so this is an example that some of you know that I like. What, um, what malady might you have that would actually be managed or cured by bloodletting? Uh, is, I don't know if chat's working or not. I can't see it. Uh, but that's, that's the first quiz of the day. What, what malady would you in 2021 actually treat by, by, by reducing blood volume. Uh, moving on. And now really fast forwarding. 
Um, the tools we use for analyzing the data are changing really, really quickly. Professor Cairo was kind enough to point out that um, uh, when we started the Dialogues and Research Ethics series, uh, I'm going to be giving a number of shout outs during this, just because it's my privilege to do it. Uh, this was something that, that, that uh, Norm Altman uh, and, and uh, uh, Wayne Strylein and I cooked up uh, 29 years ago. Uh, I'll, um, uh, how, just a really long time ago. But so is 1956, uh, which was during my lifetime. You see people moving a, a storage device at five megabytes of data. I, I don't have a watch like this, but this watch has 32 gigabytes. So we our tools for data science are changing and they're changing really. Oh, did I go in the wrong direction? I went the right direction. Okay. I've embedded the slides. Okay. Um, we talked about hypothesis testing, observation. We talked about tests. We talked about experiments. Now we don't do those so much anymore, or we still do it, but data science is in some sense relying on other people doing this. Now, instead of testing hypotheses, we see patterns in repositories of data, right? So we have a, an ordinary relational database uh, is very important for this. You can look for patterns there. In fact, anybody who doesn't access a chart is learning something about, about, how, about how, how things might actually change as, as, you, as you add data to your database, right? We're using these a lot right now to calculate, um, uh, to calculate uh, how, how to manage the, the distribution of vaccines, for example. Uh, varieties of statistical analysis, which we've done for a long time, uh, including meta-analysis, which I want, if there's time I want to talk about, and then machine learning, which when it, in its origins, uh, they used to call knowledge discovery in databases. Uh, namely, we're looking for patterns and, and sequences and that sort of thing. Pa scientists always look for patterns and that, as you know, produces the problem of induction. But, um, but for now, we have tools and very powerful tools that help us with that. Now, that's how you run an experiment these days. There's a lot of work that goes behind it, but at the end of the day, you've, you've, you've got the database, you've compiled the program, you've established the query, you hit enter, and that's what it is to run an experiment in the world of data science. Okay. That's produced a number of interesting challenges for us. And it doesn't matter whether it's machine learning or ordinary, or ordinary biostatistical technique or, or a simple relational database. It has given us a number of challenges. Um, and these are challenges everywhere. Um, we can talk about it in terms of health information, but we can talk about it in terms of other information too. Um, in part because what we've learned in a digital world is that a lot of information about how people live uh, matters for their health. Uh, a lot of things matter for everything else, and that's what we're discovering. And so we live, however, in an ethics and regulatory environment that emphasizes what's called secondary use. I believe that's a kind of a mistake. I think it's an ethics mistake. Uh, and if there's time, we'll, we'll get to that later. But the idea is that we have a regulatory reliance on downstream data use. So if you are my, well, I can't see any of the, the people now, but suppose, suppose my, my nurse is on, on, online or my physician and, and my physician uh, uh, examines me uh, and writes a report. And in her report, she basically gives an example of my, of my um, what, what malady shall I share with you? Um, uh, I actually, in updating my allergies, had to remind them that they have not noted that I have an, aller an allergy to cats. Um, and, and I'd appreciate it if you have any cats anywhere near your screen or your camera, you take them away right, right now. Um, is it okay for somebody to analyze the electronic health record to find out how many patients have an allergy to cats? And we have gone to great trouble to try and make it, to, to arrange it so the consent process is there, so this de-identified data can be used that way. Um, I, I think that that's, most people when we've asked them, so yeah, if, if, you're, if you're improving the health of populations, if you're improving transportation, if you're improving energy efficiency, if you're improving the environment, then the idea that we need to do it, get consent from everybody on earth to do these things is a non-starter. All of these things circle each other. We need to make sure we protect privacy, but with adequate encryption and, and privacy algorithms, the role of consent changes and we need to do a better job doing that. I think we're doing it here. I think I saw where uh, the All of Us program is having a, 
a, a session next week on how to use the All of Us research database. Now, those of us who are in it are there because we consented to it. Um, but I'm of the view that there's a lot of latent consent in data use. Okay. Um, I also think it entails an artificial distinction, the, the emphasis on secondary use, among clinical research and public health data. The one becomes the other becomes the one becomes the other in, in a circle. But we have, well, we have privacy rules for clinical data that come out of a uh, US legal system. We have uh, regulatory rules for research that come out of Tuskegee and Nuremberg. Uh, public health is a, is, is, a, is a challenge only because I actually heard y'all have people in your community who don't get vaccinated. <laughs> Come on, tell me that's not true. I, I just, I'm, I'm new to these parts. I can't imagine someone went through such a thing. We have people who actually, who, who don't understand the function of public health in contemporary society. Okay. This raises challenges, which I think are really interesting challenges, ethical challenges for the science of, of the, for, for the, the effect of science uh, and data science on reproducibility. Begin with a meta-analysis. Remember, a meta-analysis is where somebody doesn't do an experiment. Somebody gets a lot of different articles or reports and then builds a database to try and show the effect sizes, for example, of an intervention. Um, they, they use them in agriculture, environmental science, behavioral science, oncology, public health, and epidemiology, and so forth. Um, the sciences are all over the place. You gather a bunch of other people's experiments and then you pool them. So here's the question, and then you run and then you run a particular uh, program on on these on on these data. What would it mean to do another meta analysis and not get exactly the same results? If you pick the same studies, the same articles, use the same software, you'd have to reproduce or replicate all of these, wouldn't you? And if you don't. And something is interesting. Interesting example: you pick different studies, uh, or you did different software, or you didn't manage missingness in the way your instantiation of the version of your software. Here's an iDisk Ethics Institute collaboration uh, that we should get Ken and Nick to agree to. Here's a, here's a, here's a ethical issues related to to computational calculations involving missingness in statistics. And all, every statistician knows the problem of missingness, which by the way is also just a really cool word, uh, and knows how that can confound an analysis. How confounding is missingness? How confounding is it for our clinical trials? Or how about in our, in our, in our use of Triton at IDISC to actually try and crunch lots of data? Okay. So there's an interesting problem, I think, there, a conceptual one, an epistemological one, if you'll forgive me. Okay, I think that for data science, reproducibility and attention to it emphasizes data quality, software engineering, and so forth. Um, version control, this is an idea that I owe to, uh, to this is my, my second acknowledgement. Uh, I don't know if he's here or not, but, but I, I, do, I do want to tip my, my hat to, to, uh, to Richard Bookman, whose insights about these over the years and his support for the Ethics Institute over the years uh, has, been, has, been, has been important. Um, that, that thinking about version control as an ethical issue, I think is a very important insight. It might explain failures of reproducibility, reproducibility in the context of large data sets. Right? Um, I think it entails the following, uh, the need for improved confidence measures for corroboration, confirmation, replication. Uh, uh, that's a nudge and a wink to Otavio uh, Bueno and our colleagues in the philosophy department. I know scientists are really excited now about the problem of reproducibility, but philosophers have been worrying about these what we, confirmation, replication, corroboration for a very, very long time. What's a crucial experiment, if there is one, uh, that, that, will, that will settle a scientific dispute? Uh, we, it became a problem for biomedical science when we realized we're spending a whole lot of money on studies that are contradicting each other, not confirming each other, and not guiding us in practical applications, by which I mean for clinical care. Um, but these are, these are longstanding epistemological problems. And I think that if we do reproducibility right, uh, I saw at a glance earlier that Dr. Johnson from the writing program, a colleague, uh, April, may have been there as well. I looked at, I'm not good at image processing. Uh, have been doing a lot of interesting work in reproducibility. WAMC gave, gave Joanna an award two years ago for, for project on reproducibility. Um, that, that this is to best, best seen, I would argue, 
as, as an ethical issue related to data science that is under addressed as such. In some sense, we're talking about data data or data about data, uh, data quality, the points that I made earlier. Uh, uh, how, how, do we, how do we curate our data? Who's curating the data? In the early days of, of meta-analysis, um, uh, when people, what they would do is they would make photocopies of articles. For example, in, um, uh, in um, um, the ones that come out are environmental science and oncology. So in oncology, they get a bunch of articles from leading journals studying whether or not this particular drug, what the, what the five-year survival rate for this drug is uh, uh, in, um, in, in the literature. So I suppose there are 10 articles. Well, they'd photocopy the 10 articles. They would take the photocopies and they would cut the tops off of the article so you couldn't tell what journal it was to try and prevent there from being the introduction of any bias into the curation of other people's data. By the way, it's also a beautiful example of secondary use because the people who consented to the trial wherein they tested the cancer drug or the environmental uh, intervention didn't give consent to anybody doing a meta-analysis. And yet it would be preposterous to suggest you need to get consent from people uh, because of that secondary use of data. You, can't, you don't know who they are. Uh, so if you're a data fundamentalist, you might argue that, oh no, I need to consent to all subsequent uses of my data. Okay, look at how much more data we have to deal with now. In the context of healthcare, patient reported outcomes, a fabulous new source of data that goes straight to Beddoes and Louis, if you will. Real world data, uh, so similar to that, where, where suddenly we've discovered that, that all of the stuff that happens in our hospitals constitutes the kind of data that, that Beddoes and Louis were talking about. And the idea, these were the Beddoes and Louis and Archie Cochran were the foundations of evidence-based practice. Um, they're also in some sense, the, the, the grandparents of the very idea of learning healthcare systems. Um, there's a, a brief sidebar. There was a patient uh, at the University of Miami who asked, this, uh, and by the way, if you haven't done this yet, Google Learning Healthcare Systems. There's a journal by that name, exciting growth in literature about how we do a better job collecting, analyzing, storing, recurating, reanalyzing, reproducing data from every clinical encounter there is. If we don't get that right, we're losing a whole bunch of data. So a UM patient who had uh, prostate cancer says to his physician recommends a treatment. And this patient says, what's your recommendation based on? And the physician said, well, a very large randomized control trial. The patient says, how many patients were in the trial? And the physician said, oh, it was a very large trial of, of prostate cancer. It was uh, six, 750 patients. The patient nods and says, how many prostate cancer patients have you treated during the course of that, during, during the last 10 years? He said, oh, thousands, tens of thousands. And the patient asked, what happened to the others? Obviously the data are not collected under controlled circumstances, but they were good enough to treat these patients uh, and they are lost. They're, they're data that have been lost. And now we have hopes of capturing them um, in, in, in an ongoing learning healthcare system that constantly is rechurning the data. It is data about data and its reliability and the software tools for it. Uh, the inadequacies of the electronic health record, for instance, right? Um, it dawned on me at one point that if, uh, I don't know if there are any cosmologists or astronomers here, but remember when they discovered if you put a telescope, if you put a telescope here and another telescope here, you can, you can uh, quite literally triangulate. Uh, it's the origin of parallax. Remember how, how to do parallax if you want. You blink your eyes alternatively and you can make the entire world move. But now you have a telescope here, 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 here in a very wide array. Uh, and you can basically gather data that's slightly different. Imagine you put telescopes on different sides of the world, which we've done, which I think is how we got those fabulous pictures of the black hole that we saw that a couple, a couple of years or two ago. How we collect data and tools for improving its collection are giving us information about this important and exciting aspect of scientific method. Uh, I think we should coin the phrase here at the University of Miami, data data, uh, and, and have some fun with it. Uh, and as part of our missingness project, maybe maybe brand that as something that we can that we can study. Look what it points to. Uh, it points to citizen science and how ordinary people who are generating all that clinical data, a lot of that environmental data, uh, have been trying to generate other kinds of data as well. 
Um, if you're interested in autonomous, well, autonomous anything, but certainly autonomous vehicles, why wouldn't it be interesting to do a better job capturing those data? Otherwise, if the scientific community doesn't lead this, then the technology community will. Uh, their mission is a fine mission, but it has a different goal than the scientific community does. Their goal is to generate marketable products. Ours is to increase our knowledge about everything that, so it might be able to be used for those products. But the difference in those missions matters in terms of ethics. I have no, I have no grudge against somebody commercializing a product. Well, usually don't. Um, but when it comes to something like automotive safety, or patient safety or environmental protection, for instance, then I don't think we want to leave that to people whose mission is for profit. I think we need to do a better job. It's not to say they can't do good research and all the big tech companies do really good research. Do not misunderstand me. It's just that we don't wanna surrender all of that science to people who have an interest in the outcome. That is our colleagues from the compliance office remind us a conflict of interest. And we do not want to, we don't want to bake in those incentives to what needs to be objective hypothesis driven or data data driven science. Uh, so we have crowdsourcing. If you haven't looked at it before, please go look at uh, citizenscience.gov um, and the exam we have there. It's page after page after page. Environment, astronomy, cosmology, biology, transportation. My favorite, just because I thought the name was cool, was Adopt a Pixel. Uh, it's a little bit of geology, a little bit of other stuff. It, it basically helps people make, they take photographs that they then, they then correlate with Landsat fo uh, satellite photographs. Uh, and so I, I, I'm thinking about actually adopting a pixel. Uh, they don't judge the quality of my ability as a parent of this pixel, um, uh, uh, raising another question about reliability and, and, and that sort of thing. But what it suggests to me is that we have an opportunity at the University of Miami in the collaborations that we are working on now to do something really interesting and really exciting at the seam of data science and policy and ethics. Uh, IDISC, I think, is, is unprecedented. We, we have the IDISC boards, uh, Alberto, Nick, Ben, um, um, uh, and, uh, and Tim. I, I was, and, and I think, I think uh, 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 Eve is here too. We talk about the ways in which we we want that we we want IDIS to be able to be a kind of universal donor. There's an evolving master's degree program. There are, there's now a small grant program from across the University of Miami to try and, and produce innovative data science. And what we talked about at the very beginning was everybody's excited about AI now, and universities around the world are creating lots of data science centers. But we don't know, I don't know, maybe there is one out there uh, that has baked ethics in at the outset. And this goes back more than a year. Um, organizations now are creating centers for ethics and data science uh, in, in themselves. Uh, and that's beautiful and good. We have collaborators there. But the insight, the very idea that IDIS was there to create this insight, I am sentimental about. And so I think that I think we need to change. I, I think th this is this is a very good symbol. But I think we need to change our, our motto to, um, yeah, we've got that. Something like this. Um, sorry, that was not meant to be a, 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 some countries like thumbs up sign. The data science solves problems. Solving problem solving is really important for, for doing all these things. Or in fact, our work, your work in data science, your work in, in transportation science, your work in environmental science, your work in material science and engineering, your work in behavioral science, your, and so on and so forth, all involve solving problems. Very often they're methodological, right? Um, uh, but what I think that IDISC is able to do in a way that you'll forgive the phrase is ethically optimized is help you solve those problems. It's not just buying server time. It's not just getting a few minutes on Triton. It's trying to figure out how we can conceptualize problems in innovative ways to manage data data uh, or data about data and to solve problems. I'm, I'm, un, I'm, I'm concerned as a matter of policy, ethics, and the history of science that, that experiments have changed. And what we do is experiments on data themselves. That is, we don't analyze the world the way we used to. We analyze other re people's representations of the world by which we call information, uh, data, and that sort of thing. Remember, data, information are not, are not synonymous. 
um, uh, data, a bunch of zeros and ones for the most part. It's when we start the user interfaces that, that we come up with, how you, Dr. Cairo, um, what have you discovered in the visualization of data that actually can affect people's beliefs and its confidence? Is it possible, Alberto, that someone might actually use figures and images to deceive people? And you are asking, you're, is that a rhetorical question? It <laughs> must be joking, right? <laughs> I, it, would, it would mean standing up and that would be unseemly in the middle of a Zoom meeting um, <laughs> since I'm not wearing socks. But it, to, to pick up Alberto's book, How Charts Lie, right? This is the, 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 what UM is doing and what IDISC is doing and what the Institute for Bioethics and the Ethics Programs are doing is saying, we want, as the world of data science evolves quickly, to be able to say that our competence, if not our expertise, is going to help our colleagues and for that matter, our communities uh, to, to address these problems. Imagine, hey, Nick, how about, how about we do a citizen science project for Miami-Dade schools? Um, something that we get kids either taking pictures of stuff or, or, or texting us. I, I, so, you know, I, 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 get, I get my, uh, my I, I send an email to the CDC every day, right? Um, imagine we did a, a project, an educational project for Dade County School uh, uh, students. Uh, and have, have a PI, there you go. Let's have a high school PI for projects. Let's have high schools with lots of PIs uh, to, 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 to read Alberto's book, to look at how you can take exactly the same kind of, what, numbers, if you want, uh, and use them to deceive people. I've even heard that people can use that for, can do that um, uh, when it comes to statistics. Uh, an ugly rumor that I assume someone's going to disabuse me of. Um, that, that is to not say, ethics is not something we strap onto the side of a science, it's not an additional ethics module here uh, that, that we have to find. It is, we, we believe that in the actual course of doing this, in the course of writing the software, we're worried about version control, annotation, provenance, and so forth. In the course of actually study design, it may have to do with, with uh, what reagents you're doing, whether you're sharing your data, whether you provided good lab results, whether you've suppressed anomalous results or not. I mean, the core, core curriculum and responsible conduct of research is about methodological issues. We sometimes frame it as compliance, but I would argue it's what good scientists have been doing for a couple of thousand years. And when we, when we support that, we, when we link responsible conduct of research and data science, call it or data ethics if you want, um, and then that, and that was the, that was double AMC project. They link our responsible cognitive research with reproducibility. Uh, that's a novel idea. That's a cool idea. And IDISC in the Institute for Bioethics, which has an unhappy acronym, IDISC actually sounds kind of nice and engaging and memorable. Uh, IBIP, IBHAP, or IB, IBHIP uh, is not so good. Uh, uh, those are the URLs for these two organizations, which are collaborating in a way that I believe is distinctive, positive, and wholesome in ways that I think are, are, are really sorely lacking, already producing a return on investment, and ultimately are intellectually compelling and fun. Uh, and uh, I think I have left probably more time than anyone wants to have a discussion, um, but we have therefore nevertheless set it aside. And I am going, if I have your permission, because I'm still unsettled here, about the screen and the two monitors and there's the one screen on the left and all these damn computer tools. I wanna to do a study about, we all become data scientists when we, when we do Zoom and we find ourselves trying really hard not to look at our own faces. Um, that, thing, that, that sense you have that someone's looking you in the eye uh, is it's only because they put their picture right next to yours. Except right now I am looking Dr. Brasco right in the eye, so. <laughs> Comments, questions, criticisms. Uh, I say this was a Meta Data Scientist uh, series uh, uh, that, that I just hosted. I, I thought it'd be cool to link this with our, our 29 year old uh, uh, dialogues and research ethics. This was by the 198th dialogue in the, se in the series, which, which uh, well, the secret, the, the secret is I couldn't find a good speaker this month, so you're stuck with me. Um, but, but it seemed like an opportunity to actually do something interesting. Uh, we do have colleagues from all three campuses here. That doesn't happen often enough. Uh, and ethics and information technology has to happen. 
I, I need, uh, so Alberto, are you or Michael gonna help me with the chats or can I try and look at them now quickly? There's too much to read. So yeah, for, for, so filter them for me. Well, well, Jeff, Jeff Brosco said that, that the answer to your, your original question, um, what, what, uh, what malady I think could be ameliorated by bloodletting, hemochromatosis. <laughs> Excellent Dr. Brosco. And, um, and if, if uh, I had more time, I would put on my historian's hat and, and defend bloodletting as a treatment for all maladies, but that's maybe a topic for a different day. Uh, as, as the, as the son, oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, go ahead. I was about to joke that as the son of a hematologist myself, I should have known the answer to that question, but I completely forgot. <laughs> so Jeff knows this example. Yeah, Dr. Brasco and I have been having this exchange for quite some time. Um, uh, and, and, and what we both have agreed on is that whenever we disagree, the other is mistaken. Um, but that's exactly right. But, but imagine, imagine as a confirmation of a false theory. That's an interesting problem, right? Because, because if, if, if they've had people with hemochromatosis over the past 2000 years, they would have had ex samples of clinical success in confirmation of a completely false theory of, of medicine, which is kind so of- maybe just. Maybe just quickly, Ken, I can, again, why bloodletting and other things, so emetics and cathartics and all the sort of horrible things, we wonder why would people let that happen? And it was for thousands of years, right? I mean, this goes back through Hippocrates at least. And it was because of exactly what you're saying, the false ability of, it corroborates your, your view. So if you think of the yellow fever epidemic in the 1790s, where it's thought that yellow fever is your blood running high, well, how do you treat it? you bleed because we understood that all diseases were the imbalance of those humors. And what would happen after you bled someone? Well, they might live because not everyone died. And you'd say, aha, it worked. The bloodletting was perfect. Or that person died and you'd say, well, we didn't bleed them enough. We didn't start early enough. It was God's will. So there was always abundant examples of how medics, cathartics and so on worked, quote unquote. So that's why we think it persisted for so long. And can I lead into a question then, which is, um, and this will be for the whole crew. If you think about Pierre Louis and his numerical method in the early 1800s, part of why he made that advance in thinking about numerical method was because the, the French hospitals, the Paris hospitals existed in a way they never had before. So suddenly you had hundreds of patients lined up one next to each other and it made sense to count off how things were working or not working. So a lot of historians have argued that before you had large hospitals like that, it would have been really difficult to get your data. And so I guess the question for this group is, are there changes nowadays in our technical ability for gathering and moving data around that in of themselves are propelling the field forward? Great question. A beautiful transition. Um, the, it, so right, right. You can't, you can't collect what you can't collect, and and idiosyncratic reports uh, from from the field are not as good as having every all the sick people in one place. In fact, the growth, the history of the growth of the hospital, about which you have taught me a great deal, uh, makes possible not just that, but lots of other kinds of sciences. Some of, and, and, and it's in some sense, Jeff, it's just practical, right? It's 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 economic. I mean, if there are any if there are any people who, who are interested in the role of the economy on these sorts of things you will see that, that until there's margin, you don't have enough, uh, or a charity. I mean, most hospitals actually didn't begin as business propositions. Um, there's some people I've heard, and this is true, Jeff, in the history of medicine, there are actually some people who have taken care of people without a business plan. So live and learn. But a very important point about the arc of history here. Next question, or an open discussion. When we, when we have the dialogue, mind you, um, the, 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 we try and do this in a, in a bit of a round table. You know, we try and have a sobre mesa where we can actually have a conversation and the speaker uh, is, 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 um, doesn't talk so much as this one. All right, so Ken, let me interrupt you and ask the question there. <laughs> Thanks. So Raphael, Raphael is asking um, two questions, uh, maybe well, a comment and a question. Maybe the first one, could you flesh out the term um, as you used it in context, missing this? You used that term twice, I think. What did you mean by it? And um, could you flesh that, elaborate on that a little bit? Right, so if, if there are biostatisticians here, any statisticians, you'll be able to help me. Uh, what statisticians know when they start, when, they, when they're given a, a, a data set to analyze is they wanna know what data are not there. 
that should be there. So for example, if you're bloodletting on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I don't know if that's your practice anymore, Jeffrey, you just do Tuesdays and Thursdays. But if, if the, then, then somebody's gonna wanna know, well, well, so there's no data from Tuesday about bloodletting. Uh, and there might, it might be a confounder. It might be something about, I mean, what we've learned now, and it's worth making this important thing. I think it's something we've addressed in IDISC. I know we have across our institution. Um, what we've learned about everything, especially in the context of COVID and vaccines is there are a lot of people in our community one, who are not very good with IT, two, don't have very good transportation, and two, are gonna to tend to be poor and black. Uh, if you're if missing this coupled with what we're discovering about, about disparities in our society is no longer a technical problem. But in brief, missing this is data that you don't have that you either wish you did or should have had. Uh, I'm suggesting that missing this raises ethical issues, uh, especially in the context of, of, uh, of well, of what we've discovered about, about, about uh, our, our society. A learning healthcare system, which I think is a really cool idea, is gonna be, is gonna be a, a, a health system with a learning disability if it doesn't make sure that it's learning from all the patients in its community. We've gotta get this right. Um, I, I, I know some of you all are, are, uh, are, are as worried about that as I am. Uh, let's frame it as an opportunity. Well, another comment from Raphael is actually, this was originally when you were talking uh, maybe earlier, data sharing should be, oh, this is more of a comment here, uh, Ken. Data sharing should be okay, provided it is aggregated and cannot be traced back to the individual or used and shared to large for any reason. Uh, agree completely. That was to well, leverage, actually. What's that? What's that to leverage that? for any reason. Yeah, it wasn't too large, that was a typo. To leverage for any reason, like if you, uh, try to target someone for an ad because they have hemo. hemo right. and, uh, and, yeah. and so, and so, what we see is a kind of renaissance in 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 both in, in people trying to hack systems to find out how to prevent them from being hacked. Right? There was a, a very important article in Science a couple of years ago where somebody just took a tube of blood and by various kinds of cross filtering and whatnot was able to make an inference about who the blood came from, a, a, a quote unquote de-identified vial. That has led the informatics community to come up with ever powerful tools to prevent that from happening. We don't need to know that it's, that it's um, um, uh, this matters, by the way, I was, you know, my eyes are just lighting on faces. So, so I see Janelle Wright is there. Uh, the translational science is an example to do some of what we've been talking about here. We've had these debates at CTSI for a very long time. How do we protect privacy? And, and one of the ways we do it is, with, well, several ways. One of them is better security, better encryption, and better governance. If we can make it so that I can't hack back through the data and find out that, that, um, that, uh, that your hemochromatosis, uh, that you have hemochromatosis, uh, then we'll be able to enjoy the benefits of the science without the social risks that too often accompany it. This, I think, is, is, a, is good for privacy. Our regulatory mechanisms Janelle, you remember, we were so worried about where this broad consent is gonna be a real problem for CTSI. Guess what the NIH now requires, or permits rather, broad consent. If I'm willing to consent broadly, don't stop me, make it easy for me. Uh, that's why I gave my blood to all of us and I think it's a cool project, right? They're linking my genome to my electronic health record. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's how you manage the data, how you communicate it, how you give the benefits of it, you know? It's the, uh, the, uh, the physician who finds out the, the patient's going to die and calls up and says, you're gonna die. And the patient says, that's terrible news. It couldn't be worse. The doctor says, yeah, it could be worse. I've been trying to reach you since yesterday. Um, we, we don't do a good job of this now about communicating. In fact, patient communication. I, I've heard that there's some politicians who are not very good communicators. How it is that the industry, the automobile industry communicates so well and professionals very often so poorly. How we frame probabilistic concepts to lay audiences with comparatively low literacy is a real problem. I, I think in some sense, the conclusion to a lot of our, our problems, and, and, and Raphael has encouraged this, one of, one of our problems is we need to increase all of our literacy. IT literacy needs to be increased among people uh, in the sciences and in the clinical sciences and the environmental sciences. Ken, thanks. I'll read a couple more comments here from Jose Fernandez Calvo. Two comments from Jose. 
So first is when you were talking about collaboration, collaboration should include the law school here too. There's much interesting work that requires collaboration with lawyers. Um, so you can comment on that. And then also interesting example- no, no, one, one at a time, Michael, yeah. one at a time, it's a very important point. And there are several people from the law school who are involved in IDIS. Uh, many of you know the work of Professor Michael Frumkin and, and, and others there who are really interested in these, especially in the, in the ways that data are shared on the internet, that sort of thing. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Otavia, who's the, who's the co-director of our, of our data, of data ethics and society for IDIS, uh, uh, and those who have reached out to, to Michael and other people in the law school, there's a good question for you. Is this being communicated widely to the law school? Um, we actually have had uh, lawyers give talks as on this because maybe a, does the law school know about this? Uh, and the answer is, I, I think, well, that's why our colleagues in communications, when they send it out through, when they, our university is, is, is cursed, uh, or not cursed, uh, that, that would be, that would be uh, the ancient, uh, the evil spirits theory of disease. Um, we have three campuses and sometimes if you've been here for a while, you have acquired the belief they might be on three different planets, right? It turns out that the communication offices do not always communicate with each other. Uh, that that if, it's on a, if, if something starts on a medical campus, that no one could possibly believe that anybody in engineering, nursing, um, or music, or, or the law school would have any interest in that. Uh, Dr. Kurtman and his colleagues at Erasmus, why would anybody in neuroscience care about environmental science or laboratories at Rasmus? That's because the laboratories at Rasmus have these, have these aplesia with really cool big neurons that people are studying for neurology. So there's a group in Carl Gable studying that, there's a group in the medical campus studying it, but all the samples are in, in tanks with scientists at Rasmus. Um, so let's let we've all, well, at least Otavio, uh, you, Nick, and I have, re have reached out to the law school for an advisory board for data ethics and society. Excellent point. Well heard, and we're on the case. Excellent. So, this other comment from Jose. Jose, maybe you could, um, if you're still here, you can unmute yourself. I, I forget which. Um, what the context here was, but he says, interesting example of the work of Oxford, oh, Oxford Internet Institute, in particular, Sandra Wachter's work in bias and discrimination in AI that was incorporated by Google and Amazon um, to deal with anti-discrimination legal regulations of the EU. Oh uh, yeah, just her work is interesting because it takes um, the anti-discrimination research that is doing and bias research in AI to the practical, right? So Google incorporated her work in TensorFlow. Amazon has just incorporated it into their uh, their work on in, and so it's interesting that the practicality of dealing with the lawyers have to deal with the practical of every day, and and we're in in a bit of a philosophical realm realm with, and so this is the connection to reality that I think is is really good to to bring down the work to practical applications like TensorFlow or whatever you're working with in AI. Where that it incorporates you know, discrimination in your AI directly into the software that you're using. And that should be you know, widely disseminated, I think. All right, let me, let me before two people, uh, I, Ben and Octavio have had to drop off. It's, it's actually three minutes to go. Let me thank you all. I mean, that we've had this opportunity at our institution to do something cool and wholesome and interesting and practical. Uh, it matters a great deal. We, we don't often get together this way, but iDisc is helping to pledge that. And it's been a real privilege to be able to, to contribute. Uh, are there are colleagues who are in staff here from, from I saw Johannes Stamatis pop up. Uh, forgive the shout out, but, but we've collaborated with our colleagues uh, in compliance in the law school on all three campuses. When we get this right, we understand what universities are about. Uh, and, and I am sentimental about that. Uh, I want, please remember that and not the, how, how hunting dogs chase rabbits. Uh, thank, thanks to, to, to Michael and to Alberto for a fabulous introduction um, and, and, to, uh, and to Tim, Nick, uh, Ben and the others at IDISC, uh, especially to Jeff for keeping me honest, uh, which is uh, very often, uh, uh, I know, mm -hmm. a great challenge. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, everyone. Uh, as uh, I think that Michael wrote in the uh, in the chat window, remember that on January the twenty seventh, we will have the next a, a media data science event with Yelena Yesha. So please don't 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 miss that one. It's going to be super interesting. 
And thank you everyone for attending. See you soon.